Olivia Carbaccio Jacobowski. I'm the president of the Asian Student Interracial Association here at MSU, also known as Asia. Um, we're a newly formed association that is open to everybody, whether you're an undergraduate, a graduate stu student, heritage or non-heritage, community member, faculty or staff. Um, you can join any time. Um, this week we are having our Lunar New Year se event series, which we will have an event, one, at least one or more events a day. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about that, we have our webpage, which is asia.msu at wordpress.com. Asia MSU, like together. Asia MSU. WordPress. WordPress.com, sorry. Um, and we also have our Instagram, which is very active and we'll be posting. If you guys are more active on social media, um, our Instagram will be posting those as a reminder before each event. Um, and so I first want to thank you all, especially. I'm so excited to see such a great crowd today. Um, thank you for joining us. It's our first ever event. Um, we've only been in association for a year, so this is our first time also putting on a whole Lunar New Year event series. Um, and this event series has been in the works since, yeah, since the creation of our association, so thank you. Um, I also want to particularly thank the Extreme History Project for connecting us with Mark Johnson um, and the Honors College Honors Presents team for allowing us the space um, to discuss and learn about the true history of Chinese experiences here in Montana. So a little bit about your speaker, Mark Johnson, tonight. Um, he is an assistant professor um, with the University of Notre Dame. He is an author of the forthcoming book, The Middle Kingdom Under the Big Sky, A History of Chinese Experiences in Montana. Johnson's research focuses on telling the history of Chinese communities in Montana in their own words through a global lens. Mark was born and raised in Montana and he currently lives in Helena. Thank you, Mark, for, tra for traveling all the way to Bozeman today um, and taking the time to speak with us all, all this evening. Um, so please join me giving a warm welcome to Mark Johnson. Thank you everyone, thank you to the Honors Lecture Series, thank you to Olivia and the Asia Student Association, thank you Crystal and the Extreme History Project. Uh, I speak quite a bit around Montana uh, on different Chinese history topics, and I tell you what, Bozeman always turns out. Right? Years ago I spoke at the Museum of the Rockies under the banner of the Extreme History Project, and they, the crowd there was great. And I'm happy to speak whether there's two people or 22 or whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm excited about this topic, but it's nice to see other people interested and excited as well. As Olivia mentioned, I've got a book coming out on the Chinese experience in Montana, told whenever possible through their own words, and also through a global lens, so through an understanding of world history, Chinese history, to understand more fully how the Chinese Montanans were impacted by those broader histories, but also how they impacted the, the Chinese history as well. That first phase, though, telling the Chinese history in their own words, was made possible by students who I used to teach in Shanghai, China, and their parents and their grandparents, specifically Yuka Rochelle was one key, if you want to play it, say hello. She, she helped spearhead an organization uh, of, of a really an intergenerational project, grandparents, mothers, fathers, children, to translate documents from Montana's historic Chinese communities, one large collection of documents from the 1880s to 1920s, and one larger collection of documents from the 1930s to 1950s. And so I'm really glad to have her and her family here to, uh, to celebrate this as well and look forward to that research that was done in part because of those efforts coming out later this spring. So looking at the Chinese history of Montana, and I'm going to talk a lot about Chinese New Year. I know that it's a broader celebration than that, and it's Lunar New Year and Spring Festival. For my purposes, since I'm only focusing on the Chinese history of Montana, I will be referencing it as Chinese New Year, Chinese New Year celebration. We're going to look at how that uh, was seen throughout the territory of Montana and the state of Montana. But first of all, how many Chinese people were in Montana at any one point in time? Okay. Here's the graph that gives us a sense of their population. First territorial census in 1870, there's almost 2,000 Chinese in Montana. That represented approximately 12% of Montana's non-native population at the time. That always blows my mind a very substantial Chinese presence here from the start of non-native settlement of the territory and then the state. And you can see it peaks in 1890. 1890 is a little bit difficult for us to disaggregate that data though because the census, while well, we do have the totals for states and places around the United States, most of the specific sheets for the 1890 census were destroyed in fire. And so we can't necessarily know as much detailed information about the Chinese population in 1890 in Montana as I would like to. And then you see a rather precipitous decline 
number of reasons for that. I won't really go into that tonight. If we want to get into that in the question and answer period, we could a little bit more. I think it's pretty interesting, sad in many ways, but also to recognize the statistical quantity of Chinese people here and the impact that they made on the region. So it wasn't easy for them, life here. And then I think the next question is, we have the raw numbers. I'm moving too much for the camera, I think. Sorry. I to uh, I'm not going to try to say it one place, so yeah, there. Let's look at where they were represented the most. And the color coding tells us what year, so don't really worry too much about that. But in terms of where they were the most, this is any, any place in Montana that had a Chinese population of more than 70. So you can see Butte is definitely the largest. You will hear sometimes that Butte had a Chinese population of 2,532. Let me say that again. You'll hear sometimes that Butte had a Chinese population of 2,532. Let me go back a slide. Okay. The state at its total was 2,532. Sometimes that number gets ascribed to view for a number of historical research issues. At its height, the largest that I could quantify for Butte's Chinese population was 841. I will say that the Chinese were historically undercounted when census enumerators came around to try and count the population. Um, so I think all of these numbers are probably a little bit low, but I don't think it's 2,532 for Butte. Still, a very large Chinese population in Butte, very large in Helena, very large in Virginia City, Bozeman, over 70 Chinese people here at that time, that was 1905. But if we go a step down, this is a, a, a map with 70 or more, let's go a step down. From 10 to 69 Chinese people, we begin to see a little bit more distribution across the state. And then let's see if we can go even further down. Less than 10, they're spread really everywhere in the state where there's a population center with one exception. Small towns would probably have one or two Chinese people. I didn't go, I stopped at three here, so I didn't count two and one Chinese people, but they were, there were communities with that small of a Chinese presence. But I love this distribution and that they were really everywhere across Montana except one place. Unfortunately, my home city of Great Falls, from its founding in the 1880s, made a vow to not allow Chinese to settle there. And that persisted until 1938. Sad, sad, harsh uh, situation in, in the state that we all call home at the moment. Okay. The locations that I'm going to reference today, I know some of you are from Montana, so these will be quite familiar to you. Some of you are not. Obviously, I'll mention Bozeman, Livingston, Butte, Helena, Missoula. This little town here, Nyhart, Montana, Nyhart with two Chinese people, it will come into play. But this is really all of the places that we have documentary records where Chinese New Year was celebrated throughout the time period. And speaking of celebrating that, what we're looking at is how the Chinese maintain their cultural practices far from home in a pretty strange land. What that did was allow them comfort something that was known, something that was a connection back to home, a connectedness within the community abroad, but also here in Montana, and cultural continuity. However, as you can imagine, it also highlighted their difference. To celebrate things that seem so foreign to other European settlers to Montana could possibly uh, cause consequences for the Chinese in Montana. So they did persevere in their celebration of these rituals and, and very important cultural beliefs, but sometimes it wasn't very easy to do so. One of the cultural systems that we see often referenced in Montana newspapers is a religious tradition around the issues of this. Anybody want to take a guess as to what's going on here? This is in Missoula in the 1890s. Funeral? It is a funeral. Is a funeral procession. So we see a funeral procession, the color of white, the color of death for Chinese culture, and they're processing with the body out to where it will be buried. These are non-Chinese onlookers. And so Chinese funeral processions often have music, often have ritual wailing, and had a procession of the body gathering a lot of attention from non-Chinese onlookers. Curiosity, yes, but that could also turn into animosity quite easily. So on that issue of Chinese cultural beliefs, oftentimes their funeral processions uh, were what gathered attention. This is in Billings in 1907, talking about the funeral of a man who died there and the uh, traditions that, that go along with that. 
in a, uh, what I hope is a future project, there are a number of Chinese cemeteries that remain around the state of Montana. This is in Billings. There's about eight to 10 Chinese headstones in Billings. This is in Helena. Again, about eight to 10 Chinese headstones in Helena at a place called China Row. This is in Butte at Mount Moriah Cemetery. And that has about 25 Chinese headstones. You, you can imagine because of the population of Butte, right? And so there's at least three cemeteries across Montana that still have Chinese headstones. Okay. Would there be one closer to home? Yeah, yeah, there is. This is Sunset Hills Cemetery in Bozeman. And they've got some really fascinating headstones from the, the large Chinese community here. About six or eight, I think, is the number here. And if you'd like more information on this and like to actually see them, the Extreme History Project does a number of walking tours through Sunset Hills Cemetery. Uh, not just the Chinese aspect of Sunset Hills, but overall what the cemetery can tell us about early Bozeman. And the Extreme History Project does a walking tour of the Chinese history of Bozeman. Crystal Alegria is here, the representative for the, the, the founder of the Extreme History Project. And so I've gone on many of their events and I learn something new every time. I love them and highly recommend them to anybody that's interested. But uh, it also persists into the present day. So actually over in Butte, every spring there's a tomb sweeping festival, the Qingming Festival, a Chinese uh, custom, where the tombs are clean. This year it's going to be on May 14th, this spring. It's a little bit late. It's a little bit late. It should be earlier if we were really going by when the Chinese festival happens. But if we went by when the Chinese festival should happen, it wouldn't be tomb sweeping, it'd be snow shoveling. Okay. So they have to push it back in the spring a little bit. And if you'd be interested in that, the Maywa Society out of Butte helps coordinate those events, and it's quite a, a good celebration. And it connects it back to that historic Chinese community. Today, though, we'll be talking about Chinese New Year. Note on terminology, as you can well imagine, the newspapers written at the time were not written by Chinese people or people with sympathies towards Chinese people. So some of the terms that you'll see uh, referenced in the newspapers today will be quite racist and derogatory towards Chinese people. Okay, I want to be respectful of not verbalizing that out loud, but also to recognize the animosity that they faced here in Montana and that life was not easy. Like I mentioned before, I'll refer to it as Chinese New Year. But I won't, I won't put in my mouth some of the terms that are from the primary sources. One of the primary sources noted how important Chinese New Year was for the state's Chinese population when it said, but the Chinese take this 4th of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's all in one week instead of distributing them throughout the year. The biggest celebration all wrapped into, actually it's more than one week, but the onlookers didn't really know that, but a massive celebration, and if any of you have experienced Chinese New Year's, it is a massive celebration, even if you're just two Chinese people living in, in Nyhart, Montana. And so a non-Chinese onlooker is looking at this saying, wow, it seems to be Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, all at one time. And so those of you who have Chinese cultural knowledge, what type of things could we expect from a Chinese New Year celebration? What type of foods, what type of activities would happen? Shukwa? Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
talking about the red envelope to and and uh, the, the couplets, the blessings, the types of food, the types of celebrations would be really foreign to non-Chinese Montanas looking in. But we see them reporting on it here. And here we see in Livingston in 1884, a visit to several of the Chinese establishments in Livingston yesterday showed that the children of the Flowery Empire were enjoying their New Year as, as much as the facilities of their limited number in town allowed. There's only 49 Chinese in Livingston, and yet it's such a party, such a celebration that it definitely makes the local newspapers. Maybe not with uh, a total understanding of what, what was going on, but they're a small community, very far from home, keeping this culture and connectedness alive. Okay, so that's our Livingston connection. We've also got three different locations and three different accounts. One is from a much earlier time in Helena in 1872 with a gentleman named Hong King, and he's a merchant. And he will uh, take some guests into Chinatown to help them understand and experience what the Chinese New Year celebration was about. The other is a very famous man from Butte, or who made his home in Butte, Dr. Hui Pak. And he had only been in America about four years when he helps some non-Chinese people celebrate Chinese New Year in 1896. And then the third is, here from Bozeman, Chin Ah Bon, in 1926-1927, when he also hosts a feast to celebrate Chinese New Year with several non-Chinese people. Now, I've been talking a lot. I'm a teacher at heart. I know that telling is not teaching, listening is not learning. So I'm going to push the thinking on to y'all here for a little bit. There's going to be some choice here. If you'd like to explore the Helena example and Tong Hing, that's going to just be a white piece of paper, and Crystal's going to help pass that up with Olivia as well. If you'd like to look at the Butte example of Dr. Hui Pak, that's green. And then Chin Ah Bon in blue is for Bozeman. I'd like to spread them out roughly, equivalently. If you feel strongly about one, if you're really interested in Butte or from Helena or something like that, then feel free to speak up. Otherwise, uh, the people who are assisting in, in distributing things will just try to distribute them uh, as, as sporadically as possible. Thank you for engaging in that. Sometimes you take a chance with an audience like that, and they sit on their hands and don't really jump in. I appreciate your activi activity, sharing back and forth, maybe meeting a new friend, uh, go out to dim some with or something like that. <laughs> so, good. So, different accounts of Chinese New Year. We have to recognize that these are not told through a Chinese lens. These are non-Chinese Montanans who are reporting on this. Uh, but I, I, I like that it's different time periods and different locations. Cameron, can you take us through Butte and just tell us maybe what you found interesting about the Butte account? Yeah, Butte was definitely really interesting. We had Dr. Park, and he was kind enough to send his hands and give these more on the wealthy side, more on the upper class side of um, his kind of home cooked meals. Yeah. And um, it was really interesting because afterwards I had a nice talk about what China and the US could do to possibly have a better relation. And then within that same year, in the town of Butte, the uh, town, or at least um, some people tried to push all of the people from China out of the town. Yeah. There's a major boycott against the Chinese in Butte in 1896. And that's the same year that Dr. Hui Pak is hosting this Chinese meeting. The, the boycott happens much later. But an aggressive, it doesn't go, thankfully, to the point of violence against the Chinese in Butte, but it was close. And uh, tried to push all the Chinese from Butte. The Chinese in Butte actually took the, the, the issue to court using the American legal system and won an injunction against the boycott. So a moment of, of great pride and kind of use of the systems. Only a couple of years later, through a series of pretty interesting events that is detailed in chapter four in my forthcoming book, Shameless Plug, uh, <laughs> there's actually an armed militia of Chinese soldiers marching and practicing with live ammunition in Butte. It's amazing. And that's through a series of global events that come to bear in view. So Cameron talked about who was involved, who was invited. Somebody else who had the Butte example, what positions did the guests have in the non-Chinese guests? Yeah, they were all listed first. They were listed first, yeah. And then, and then they listed the prominent Chinese participants afterwards. And most of the people at this, at this event were non-Chinese. What jobs did they have in Butte, these non-Chinese guests to Dr. Kui Park's event? Yeah. Judge. What else? Shout it out. Mayor. Mayor. Lawyer. Accountant. High up people in Butte society. And so Dr. Hui Pak, who's only been in Butte for five years or so, might be trying to position himself with the movers and shakers in Butte 
and try to protect his status. He will actually be a very fascinating member of Butte's Chinese community where he has a lot of interactions with the white community. And uh, back in the 19-teens, when there was another pandemic sweeping the, the globe, Dr. Peacock's medical knowledge actually was sought out as if he had um, kind of different ways of approaching the Spanish influenza that helped save lives that maybe Western medicine didn't, didn't necessarily have. So you've got the Butte example there, okay? Take us to Helena, take us to Helena. 1872, we've got Tong Hing and Helena. I'm gonna go with uh, London. details. And of course, some of that did happen. I try to get away from that, try to understand Chinese culture as it was expressed here um, in less exoticized type ways. Now, London, do you think the person writing that article had an excited readership? Do you think people wanted news about Chan Helena's Chinese community? I would say so. Yeah. He's talking about, you know, I'll go back and I'll get you more stories. So this is good news print. People were interested in this. Tong Hing himself, though, might have been doing a little bit what Hui Pak was doing, because Tong Hing is very specifically angling to be with the white leaders of Helena's community. Tong Hing was a go-between between the Chinese community and the white Helena community. He had helped apprehend uh, an alleged murderer two years earlier, a Chinese man who was lynched, sadly. And many in, China, in, in Helena, Chinese or non-Chinese, thought that this guy had done nothing wrong that he had taken action in self-defense. Tom Hing helped him get captured. I really think Tom Hing was playing both sides and trying to be somebody who could kind of go between both without really putting his chips all on one side or the other. Okay, so he's trying to be a mover and shaker. He's the only non-white person on Helena's Fire Safety Commission. So he's got these elevated, interesting positions. But we get this early account from 1872. Then we get a later account, 1926, 27. Before we go there, though, anything I missed in the Helena account, Dane? Anything find interesting? Coming to you, enlighten us. We hear a lot about Chinese men. Is all we've talked about to this point. Is there any evidence that there was a, a gender difference? Oh, Dane, come on, man. You got it. Center of the page. Second paragraph. The proverbial modesty of the Chinese ladies. Chinese ladies. So there are some Chinese women in Montana at this point in time, as Dane tells us. Thank you. Not many though. At this point in time, there's about 20 Chinese men for every Chinese, one Chinese woman that there is. Okay. So not many families could be formed here on this side of the Pacific. Bozeman. What happened in Bozeman? We've got Chinon Law, 1926, 1927. Matt. Obviously, much later date. So I think uh, a lot of the population antagonism probably has dropped a lot by now because of few, far fewer Chinese around. Um, it's a very positive article. Uh, he also entertains the who's who of Bozeman doesn't seem to mention any other Chinese guests at yeah, the meal. I agree. Um, but it, it, overall, pretty positive article. Uh, I thought the two things I thought really interesting is uh, you know they were talking about the feast and how it went. It was all good. The male section unleashed their belts two notches, and the next day he closed the restaurant and left and went back to China. Yeah, yeah. 
So he was not having this meal to try to uh, curry favor. That's he a great was, point. He was saying goodbye. That's a great point. Which could mean that he knew all these people quite well, and they wanted to say goodbye to him, and he wanted to say goodbye to them. Um, I also thought it was quite interesting the way they described him. Uh, you know, you could steal from him, and he wouldn't even get upset. You know, he had that, that quality that people wanted with the Chinese that um, they wouldn't get upset. Um, and, uh, and as you mentioned, at that time, he wouldn't even have been able to become a U.S. citizen. Yeah, the, that last line, it says, he, he, unlike the other Chinese in Montana, Chin Avon is a, is a solid citizen. So they're praising him to the detriment of everybody else. But the fact of the matter is, Chinese in America could not become citizens. The only group that was barred from citizenship could not take the process to become a naturalized citizen of the United States until 1943. So when people in that article say, hey, Chin's, Chin's a good guy, he's a solid citizen. No, he won't let it be a citizen. The laws that, not you, the person who went to this dinner, but the society of which you're a part passed had excluded this large class of people in, in America from accessing citizenship. The only way that Chinese people in America could become citizens is to be born here. What's the problem with that? As Dane just told us, there's only a few Chinese women here. Well, could the Chinese marry other non-Chinese people and have kids? From 1909 to 1953 in Montana, they couldn't. It was against the law for Chinese people to marry non-Chinese people. This was very specifically done to try and make it so that Chinese families didn't take root here and become Chinese American families. And yet, even in the midst of all that animosity and antagonism, they celebrated their rituals they kept. What made them different and somehow, and, and to bring scorn, they kept those aspects alive. You also can celebrate this if you want to go over to Butte next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, actually. Chinese New Year in Butte will be celebrated by the Maywa Society on February 5th at 3 p.m. It's called the Shortest, Coldest, Loudest Parade in Montana. <laughs> it's quite a bit of fun, so come on over and, and take part in it if you'd like. We have accounts from Butte and Bozeman and Helena and other places as well. This one from Bozeman from 1884 talks about the firecrackers that are always a part of Chinese New Year celebrations. Actually, not always a part of Chinese New Year celebrations. When I was living in Shanghai, the air quality got so bad that the city uh, passed an ordinance that fireworks were not allowed. And citizens comply. I, you wouldn't see that in many places, uh, other places around the world. And uh, from the Bozeman Weekly Chronicle in, in 1886, said they celebrated the Chinese New Year even though their numbers in Bozeman were dwindling. And they weren't dwindling because of boycott, as it says here. A lot of other places in Montana, the Chinese had been pushed out by boycott and violence or threats of violence, but rather that too many white women were now taking the jobs that the Chinese took in Bozeman tradition. Oftentimes we think of Chinese jobs in the West as gold mining and railroad work. That was indeed the case early on. Shortly after that, though, they moved into restaurant work, laundry work, gardening, timber, and a lot of times the complaint was that these Chinese workers are taking the, the jobs that white women would normally have. Whether that was true or not, oftentimes when there was boycotts against the Chinese and they tried to push them out of the economy, nobody took that niche in the economy and filled it. And so the Chinese came back and served in those roles and served quite well. Moving on on the Chinese New Year celebrations, we talk about maintaining the cultural connectedness and the comfort and practicing those things, but it could also uh, be a target. And so one thing that you'll often see referenced is the Chinese temple in towns in Montana. Oftentimes it's not called a temple, oftentimes it's called a Joss house or a Josh house. And the god in the Chinese temple would be called a Joss or a Josh. And the paper that was burned or the, the, the sticks of incense would be called Josh sticks and things like that. We think that's because of colonial incursion into Asia and Portuguese uh, co colonialism down in Southeast Asia, Macau and places like that. And the Portuguese word for God, Dios, kind of getting through a game of telephone, getting transformed from Dios, Dios, Dios into Josh. Okay? But the Josh temple or the Josh house is the Chinese temple. This is from the temple in Virginia City, Montana, a uh, much earlier time period. And so that'd be the, the location where they would oftentimes celebrate these rituals. Virginia City had a Chinese population of almost 300, and usually when there was a large enough Chinese community, there would be an actual temple. When there wasn't, it didn't mean that worship stopped. And so in Anaconda, 
we see that in the, this establishment, the God of love, war, prosperity, and peace makes his home in one corner of the laundry. Just a Chinese laundry is set up with one corner dedicated to kind of being the temple for the community. The Anaconda God is not a very pretentious God, yet he receives much reverence. And Anaconda is merely a, go, a gaudy picture, so to speak. Okay, so big temple in Virginia City, corner of a laundry in Anaconda, and all, all different kind of places elsewhere. In Anaconda, life was not easy for the Chinese. I said that wherever they were, they're going to celebrate Chinese New Year, and yet this article from 1895 says, no, you're wrong. All in the dead quiet. Chinese New Year was not observed in Anaconda this year. The reason? The handful of celestials who remain in this city seem to be thankful that they are able to live here and were unwilling to call attention to their presence by any demonstration. They didn't celebrate because it made them stand out so much, and it seems like something had just happened that made them make a cost-benefit analysis and say, this isn't worth it. We've got to try and keep our head down. Well, some things had just happened. In Anaconda in 1885, there was an explosion in a Chinese laundry, possibly uh, you know, an attempt to terrorize the Chinese community and three were killed. 1885 was not a good year for the Chinese in Montana or across the American West. A major massacre happened in Rock Springs, Wyoming in September of that year, killing almost 30 Chinese. Chinese were driven out of Tacoma, Chinese were driven out of Seattle temporarily, and attacks happened across Montana for our purposes here in Anaconda. In 1893, there was another boycott, and in 1896, there was an attempt at arson against Chinese dwellings in Anaconda. So they're looking at this situation, surrounded by enemies, surrounded by animosity, and saying, maybe this year we don't suffer. That was pretty unusual for Chinese communities uh, in the area. This is a later in 1909 in Billings, when the Chinese temple in Billings was vandalized as well. With religious zeal and true missionary spirit, Lee Hampton and Dennis Sun Lee rudely and forcibly broke up the services of the gods of China, which were being held in the Joss House on the south side of town. So an attack in Billings as well, much later than that attack in Anaconda. And the question I want you to ponder is this. Why did anti-Chinese forces seem to target temples and Joss houses? Why did they seem to target temples and Joss houses? I don't know if this is a clue or not. I'm not doing your thinking for you. But again, here's the populations of these areas. And so you saw Anaconda with those attacks only had 17 Chinese at its height, whereas Billings had 84 at its height. You got Butte at almost 900. Do you think there will be attacks on the Butte Temple? Is it an issue of numbers? Turn and talk to somebody close to you, geographically speaking, not necessarily relationally. If you don't know each other, that's fine. Uh, why do you think temples were the target often of anti-Chinese attacks? Give it 30 seconds. Talk to somebody close. To you. Hands. And so that othering 
might be why they were targeted. I think, I think there's definitely something to that. What else? If you dislike a group of people, the best way to attack them is to attack their faith. Yeah. It's an existential threat. And if you can erase their existence, and erase not only their existence, but the existence of their gods, well, that's a hit. I think, I think you're right. If, if you hate a group, and you're going to take violent action, unfortunately, if, if human nature is leading you down that path, this would be a very symbolic way to do it. And I will also say, a symbolic way to do it, maybe without shedding blood. Right? Yet there is violence against these structures, and I won't, I won't say that that's not violence, but it's not shooting, stabbing, killing. It's, it's maybe on the way there, but sending a message possibly at that existential battle between the faiths. I think that's an interesting answer. What else are we missing? It's a place of gathering. Place of gathering. A static place of gathering. If you're an anti-Chinese group and you want to find the brunt of what you hate, you know where to find it. In the Chinese temple. Yeah. Yes? Also, I think uh, breaking up community, like yeah. in a place that people feel safe, making them feel unsafe, and where do they have to go after that? How sad is that? But I think you're onto something. Breaking up community, a place that people feel safe, and we've been establishing the whole time there is a sense of comfort, connectedness, grounding in your culture, and if you're going to hit against this community that you maybe don't like, hitting against that hits against all those elements and makes that safe place feel by definition unsafe. I think you're onto something too. What about the map and the numbers? Can we surmise anything about where it might happen? Will it happen more where there's fewer Chinese, more where there's more? What do you think? Easy target, fewer Chinese. If there's fewer Chinese possibly an easy target, maybe they won't fight back. And oftentimes the myth of the Chinese, as Matt mentioned as he was reading in the Bozeman article, is that the Chinese are passive, they're not going to fight back, you can kind of put upon them whatever uh, vitriol you want, and they're not going to push it back. We know that's not true. They fought back in the courts, they fought back in, uh, in many different ways. There was a famous anti-American boycott in 1905, where things got so bad for the Chinese in the American West that a boycott that started in Shanghai tried to boycott American goods to try and make the American government change its laws. So they weren't passive, but that was the myth. So maybe it's a case of if there's fewer of them, more attacks are going to happen. Do you think they would dare attack the Chinese temple in Butte? With 900 Chinese there? Well, let's see. Let's see. I don't know. Here's Butte's Chinatown in 1891 with Sanborn Fire Insurance maps. And you can see some Chinese dwellings here, Chinese dwellings here. Here we see the Joss House taking up two lots. This is at 17 West Galena Street. And it makes it on the way of the, the 1891 map there. And almost a thousand Chinese were in Butte at this point in time. Right. Okay. Here it is. We actually have a picture of it from 1902. Not a great picture, but there's not many that exist from that time period that are great. So here's the Chinese temple in 1902. And here's what was in the Chinese temple before. The temple keeper said, at first we had a little joss, just the head of a, a made of a piece of log. Next, we made a larger one with arms and, and no legs. And then, listen to his pride here. Ten years ago, in 1889, we made this fine big joss with outstretched arms, beautiful face, and logs. The temple keeper who's giving this uh, interview claimed to be 107 years old. It's a long interview, it's rollicking, he's got quite a sense of humor, but he's talking with pride about the gods the statues of the gods that are inside the temple. Sadly, though, the only reason we have this picture is there was vandalism and an attack on it in 1902. And so this large Chinese community, you can see vandals invade Chinese temple. And this is what they did to those gods that he was so proud to proclaim how they made them and cared for them. Three gods were permanently retired from business when a man whose brain was filled with devils broke into the Chinese Joss House at an early hour. Two prayer rugs were desecrated also. But, the article goes on to say this, never in all the history of the Chinese in Butte has anyone dared to violate the Joss House. So maybe this is a one-off. Maybe this is the one only time that it was attacked. You can tell by my tone that it wasn't. In 1885, it was attacked. Again, in 1885, I told you 1885 was not a good year for the Chinese across the American West. Arson was attempted at that Chinese temple. And then in 1899, precious objects were stolen from it. 
So this didn't seem like a one-off. This seemed like a continuity of anti-Chinese actions against that place that should be a place of safety and comfort and cultural connectedness. But they rebuilt. They rebuilt, and we have a picture of it, of the inside of the next iteration. Here's the Chinese temple in the next, uh, after those gods had been destroyed. The temple, and then you, there you can see the temple god. And actually, actually, if you want to take a road trip over to Butte, at the Mei Wah Society, here is that temple god. Brought over from China in 1905. Still on display at the Mei Wah Society. So I go back one, you can see in that picture, maybe it works. See that picture here? And today. Later on, after that 107 year old Chinese temple keeper had passed on, a different one talked about what his role was in the temple. At the Butte Temple, the temple keeper assists in the supplicants, the prayer, prayerful, with religious offerings, burning joss sticks, lighting candles, pouring wine before Guan Ti, Wang Yi, this guy here and burning spirit papers. So we've got a guy whose job it is to be the temple keeper. How rare was that across Montana? In 1880, the 1880 census only listed two Chinese priests all across the entire state of Montana. That was too many for some. Because in 1892, the 1892 Gary Act, which was a strengthening of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chinese Exclusion Act is often misunderstood to exclude all Chinese. Chinese Exclusion Act specifically excluded workers. Okay. But in 1892, priests were reclassified as workers. So again, as the gentleman in the back with the yellow hat mentioned, a place of safety and comfort, they're trying, the American government is trying to take away even the people who will serve the prayerful at those Chinese temples. Saying temple keepers can't come in, priests can't come in to serve this community. And yet, in 1905, we find temple keepers in a special census that was taken in 1905. That's an interesting story in itself. We find temple keepers in Livingston, in Bozeman, Missoula, Helena. So while they have been barred by law, they find a way, either they develop those skills here, or somehow they got in to minister to the spiritual needs of the population. With or without a temple, with or without a temple keeper, Chinese New Year was celebrated, Chinese culture was kept alive. And so we have the places where they were referenced today. I want you to take a specific look, though, at Nyhart, Montana. Nyhart with two Chinese residents. In 1899, the two Chinese residents of Nyhart, Montana, in order to change their luck, did obeisance to Joss and observe Celestial New Year at Helena. Tom Gong and Lee Ji got back on Monday and clattered the delights of the occasion. They went from Nyhart, Montana, to Helena to worship. And this actually is the altar from the Helena Temple. It's housed at the Montana Historical Society today. So these two guys went from Nyhart to Helena. How many of you have been to Nyhart? Yeah. Up there skiing at Showdown, I imagine, maybe? Among other things. Yeah, yeah. Nyhart. Not many people have gone to Nyhart now. Or it used to be a booming silver town, but these two guys went this far. How far is that? It's about 250 miles round trip in spring in Montana. That speaks to a strength, a perseverance, a desire to keep their culture alive despite great odds that I think is definitely admirable. I know I admire it when looking back at the Chinese history of Montana. And I'll say what we're doing here this week is in continuity and keeping with keeping Asian history alive throughout Montana's long history. So what these two gentlemen did in making that long trek I came down from Helena today. It was a pretty easy drive to talk with you all, and you've been a great audience. But just the sacrifices they made and the, the lengths they went to to keep their culture alive, I think is definitely admirable. Thank you very much.